hear these sacred words. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples. And he said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that had never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say, The Lord needs it, and we'll send him back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street, and they were untying it. Some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told him what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem, and he went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, it was already late. And he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Praise God for the hearing of these sacred words. Thanks be to you. Good morning. So we finally arrived. This is at the beginning of Holy Week, the holiest week in the Christian year. And there is a day-by-day -day narrative. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I invite you into an experience of all of those days, beginning with this day, Sunday, the day that Jesus entered Jerusalem, the day that we call Palm Sunday. Before we get started, let us pray. Gracious God, it's good to be in your temple, among your people, in the presence of your spirit and your word. Lord, remind us now and always that your son came in peace and he came in justice. May we go in peace and with justice. In Christ's name we pray by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. How many of you are familiar with the name John Blair, the local environmentalist John Blair? Okay, good. For those of you who don't know, John Blair has been doing his environmental thing longer than I've been doing my TV news thing, and that's a long time. So John Blair, I think it is safe to say that while our air and water and soil is not as clean as it, as it should be, because of John Blair, uh, it, it's cleaner than it, than it would be otherwise. He has been for some 50 years trying to improve the quality of of our environment. Now he is also a journalist, interestingly. Uh, John is a Pulitzer Prize winning photojournalist. I haven't won a Pulitzer Prize yet and, and I'm running out of time. But, 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 but John was a journalist. He was an accomplished journalist. But he was captured by the condition of the planet on Earth Day a long time ago and he has dedicated his life might even say he has sacrificed his life to make the place where we live more, more livable. John's a smart guy. John could have done lots of things with his life, could have made lots of money, and he dedicated his life to the environmental causes. I want to share one story of John Blair. That picture illustrates it. Back in 1985, Union Carbide wanted to put in a PCB removal facility in Henderson County. And despite the objections from John Blair and others, it was approved. And so on one day in December of 1985, as they got ready to break ground on this facility, John Blair entered the scene in dramatic action. And the golden shovels that had been prepared for that groundbreaking, John Blair scooped up in his arms and ran. He 
He didn't get very far. You can see him right there being arrested. You can see there's a uniformed officer there. I'm not sure who the other gentleman is, but John did not get away with it. He got arrested. He got taken to jail for his dramatic demonstration, for his dramatic action. Now, I don't bring up John Blair to put him on a level with, with Jesus Christ. I, I bring him up to help me explain to you what Jesus was up to when he went up to Jerusalem on the day we call Palm Sunday. You see, John Blair might not know it, but he was following in a tradition of the Hebrew prophets by when words aren't enough, actions have to happen. John Blair engaged in dramatic action to get attention and to make a point, and the prophets did this too. The Old Testament prophets did this too, and they operated uh, by communicating in three general categories. They operated by what they could see. They were visionaries, and they could see the way the world operated and see which way it was going, and so they could almost predict the future. They weren't predicting the future exactly, but they were so wise in the way that they saw the world that they could see what would happen down the road. They operated and communicated through what they would say. Some of the prophets wrote down their prophecies. Others had their prophecies written down for them. And finally, they operated and they communicated by what they would do. And that's the category we want to concentrate on this morning, what they would do. And I could go through the Hebrew scriptures, pull out any prophet in there, and make this case, but I'm only going to make my case with three. The three prophets that we call the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Isaiah, in order to make the point that those who put their trust in foreign alliances rather than in God might find themselves carried away into exile. And so Isaiah, for three years, walked naked and barefoot around Jerusalem. Can you imagine? Naked and barefoot for three years, he walked around Jerusalem in dramatic action to say, don't put your trust in foreign powers. If you put your trust in foreign powers rather than putting your trust in God, you could find yourself led away naked and barefooted. Now, it's interesting to me that it seems that you, all you would have to say is naked, and that takes care of barefooted, right? <laughs> but maybe what's going on here is that that word that's translated naked, I think it probably means exposed buttocks. Exposed buttocks. And so, if you don't Trust God and instead trust foreign alliances, you could find yourself taken away with your buttocks exposed into exile. That's dramatic action. Jeremiah. God told Jeremiah uh, to take his loincloth. There's an underwear theme here, I, I get. God told Jeremiah to take his loincloth and take it and bury it in the cleft of a rock and leave it there. And then he sent him back there after some time had passed. And he pulled that loincloth out of the cleft of the rock. And you might imagine what condition it was in. It was worthless. And so through dramatic action, Jeremiah was saying, if you don't listen to God, you could end up being as worthless as this loincloth. And finally, Ezekiel. Ezekiel actually ate a scroll. He munched down on a scroll in dramatic action to say, when I speak, I am speaking the very word of God. Dramatic action by the Hebrew prophets. Now, I'm sure you've heard somewhere along the way that Jesus had three offices. Now, these aren't literal offices. These are, these are metaphorical offices or symbolic offices or spiritual offices. But you've heard of Jesus being referred to as king and priest and prophet. King and priest and prophet. Now, he came closer to being an actual prophet than he did to ever being crowned king in a literal way. And he wasn't a priest, even though the book of Hebrews describes him 
and his function as a priest, but he too followed in the footsteps of those Hebrew prophets by employing dramatic action. Just as Ezekiel ate the scroll, just as Isaiah walked around with his buttocks showing, just as John Blair stole the golden groundbreaking shovels, Jesus stages a double demonstration. A double demonstration. And Jesus is protesting the violence of Roman imperial power and the religious collaboration with that power. Jesus recognizes that it is the collusion between the Roman governor Pilate and the Jewish high priest Caiaphas, and he demonstrates against what they are doing. He does it in two dramatic events, each with dramatic action and a prophetic citation of dramatic action in the Old Testament. The first demonstration happens in the entry to Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday, the account that you just heard Pastor Andy read. Now the setting is Jerusalem at Passover at the beginning of the last week of Jesus's earthly life, the week we call Holy Week. Pilate, get this, Pilate comes in from the west, right? He comes in from the west with additional troops, right? You got that picture? That's not in the text. We know that by the history of what happens at Passover, but Pilate comes in from the west, and Jesus comes in from the east. Already, already, just identifying that, we know that this is a dramatic action on the part of Jesus on this Sunday. Pilate comes in on a horse. That conjures up images of war. Pilate's coming in with extra two, uh, troops and a horse. He's coming in to keep the peace. The city is full of people for Passover. He wants to make sure things don't get out of hand, and so he keeps the peace through the threat of violence. Additional soldiers don't get out of line, and Jesus comes in on a donkey, on a donkey. Now, all four Gospels have an account of the entry of Jerusalem by Jesus. If you look at Matthew, you can get the idea that Jesus came in on a donkey and a foal of a donkey. And so we might say that Jesus rode in on a nursing donkey. Do you see the contrast? Do you see the message? Jesus comes not in violence. Jesus comes in peace. And how do we know? Because of the citation. Now, the citation doesn't come in Mark. It comes in the other Gospels, but there is an allusion to the prophetic action from the Hebrew prophets, this time from Zechariah. Zechariah says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, your Messiah comes to you on a donkey. Triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Pilate enters in order to keep the peace through the threat of violence. Jesus enters Jerusalem to put an end to war and to violence. The first demonstration is a protest against Roman imperial power. The second demonstration is a protest against religious collaboration with the Roman governor, and to catch it, we have to read on a little bit in the book of Mark. We've been on Sunday, and the other gospels, the other synoptic gospels, Matthew and Luke, have these two events happening on the same day, happening on Sunday. Mark has them happening one on Sunday, the first one we just talked about, and the next one on Monday. And so we're not going to be here tomorrow, so I'm going to read the text for tomorrow and this second dramatic demonstration. Then they came to Jerusalem, 
And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling and those who were buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. He was teaching and saying, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. Hold on to that. And when the chief priests and the scribes heard it, they kept looking for a way to kill him, for they were afraid of him because the whole crowd was spellbound by his teaching. And when evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. That is the prophetic action. Jesus overturns the tables of the money changers in that dramatic demonstration. Did it put an end to what they were doing in the temple? No, it did not. But he was symbolically abolishing the temple because they, the temple had become in collaboration with the Roman occupation. And here is the Old Testament prophetic citation that proves what Jesus was doing there. This comes from Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Stand in the gate of the temple. Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah, you who enter these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and change your doings and let me dwell with you in this place. Do not trust in these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. Don't use that phrase. Especially don't use it three times and think it's going to keep you safe. For if you truly amend your ways and your doings, if you truly act with justice with one another, if you do not oppress the alien, the orphan, and the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not go after other gods to your own hurt, then I will dwell with you in this place, in the land that I gave to your ancestors forever and ever. But here you are, trusting in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say we're safe? only to go on doing these abominations. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your sight? <clears throat> I, too, am watching, says the Lord. This second demonstration is a protest against the religious collaboration with Rome. The temple is no longer the house of God because it has been the house of religious collaboration with the occupier. God says, don't, don't expect the temple to save you if you're going to go on and do violence to the alien, the orphan, and the widow, and go out and worship other gods. I'll destroy the temple. Worship is fine and it's good, but what I want is justice and what I want is peace. There's an obvious lesson in these two demonstrations. And one can be applied directly to the church, right? What we do here on Sunday morning is important really important to gather, to be together, to share with one another, to support one another, <clears throat> to open the word, to hear the word proclaimed. That's important. It's important stuff. We're formed as community. We become the body of Christ through that. But it can't stop there. It can't stop there. Like Jesus, we have to go in peace and go and bring justice. And I'll give you one example where I'm very proud. Next month, the United Methodist Church is going to meet in general conference and we're gonna rectify an injustice that we've carried out against our gay brothers and sisters. We're gonna correct that by taking the language out of the discipline that has hurt people, really and seriously hurt people. That's justice. You think that'll bring peace? I think it'll bring peace. That's one example of what the church is called to be and, and to do. A question. Why 
didn't Jesus get killed on Sunday? Or at least by Monday? Why didn't he get killed on Monday when he came in in an obvious demonstration against Pontius Pilate and the Roman occupation? Why didn't they kill him then? Or why didn't they kill him Monday when he went into the, into the temple? Why didn't they arrest him, take him out and kill him then? If you read Mark all the way through, you'll see that Jesus was protected by the crowds. He was protected by the crowds. They were all around him. They were in front of him, and they were behind him, and they were all around. And the last thing that the Romans wanted was a disturbance during Passover, so they really couldn't get to him. And Jesus didn't stay in Jerusalem, if you read he went to Jerusalem by day, and then he went back to Bethany by night, where it was safe. Where it was safe. That's how Jesus survived, as long as he survived. It would be on Thursday. It would be on Thursday that Judas would see an opening. And Judas went to the authorities and said, you can't get him by daylight in Jerusalem, but I know where he stays, and I'll show you where he is when he's moving from Bethany to Jerusalem. And that is Monday, Thursday, and that does get Jesus killed. At the trial before Pilate, Jesus looks at Pilate and says, My kingdom, my reign, is not of this world. And, and we have taken that to mean that Jesus said, Hey, uh, Pilate, you take care of earthly things, and I'll take care of heavenly things. But that's not what he meant. He meant that your world is one of violence and evil, and my world is one of nonviolence. It's one of peace and justice and love. And so, I want to make this appeal. Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, those services are so important. They're so important. If we skip from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday, we go from celebration to celebration. I invite you to make a point to be here at noon. Well, let me back up. Be here Thursday for our services on Thursday evening. Be here Friday for Good Friday at noon, and then if you can, at Aldersgate in, in the evening. Those services are so important, so, so important in getting the full picture and how Jesus indeed sacrificed himself for our sake. I hope to see you there. I hope to see you there. And I'll end with another couple of questions. Do you think that John Blair's dramatic demonstration was effective? The plant opened. Do you think his demonstration was effective? Do you think Jesus' double demonstration was effective? I think you know the answer to both.